Yet another COVID-19 variant is making its way through parts of Asia and Europe. Will it hit the US next? Hello, I'm Aaron Naidu and this is The Heat. The Omicron subvariant known as BA2, BA.2 has the Chinese city of Shanghai on lockdown. 26 million residents have already done one round of testing and are scheduled for two more, with thousands of asymptomatic cases reported. Since March, Shanghai has reported more than 73,000 cases that tested positive in the current wave of infections. The Omicron variant can quickly disseminate with a longer incubation period. At present, the epidemic situation in Shanghai is highly volatile and extremely serious. Meanwhile, countries across Europe are seeing an uptick in infections, but many countries will be lifting mask mandates and easing travel restrictions. Even though cases in the United States have dropped, experts say removing pandemic measures could increase the risk of infections with the subvariant reaching its borders. To, uh, even, um, to discuss this, let's bring in uh, Dr. William Hazeltine from Fairfield County, Connecticut. He is the chair and president of Access Health International and author of Omicron, From Pandemic to Endemic, The Future of COVID-19. Bill, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us again. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's look at these numbers in Shanghai. 13,000 cases reported. As we just heard one of the Chinese officials tell us, it's volatile. It's very serious. Most of the people who have been infected have been infected with the Omicron variant BA.2. This is a very popular city, of course. All parts of China are populous. How much concern is there over this variant? Well, BA.2 is about 10 to 12 times more infectious than the original strain they needed to contend with. Um, if you've been vaccinated, it can give you a lot of protection against serious disease, not necessarily from infection. Um, but it's still something quite serious. And for unvaccinated, it's just about as serious as the original strain. So there's a great deal of concern, and they're taking very serious measures to control it. You know, as we've just... Uh said, you know, more than 26 million people have been tested in Shanghai. Um, can you give us a sense of how big a logistical challenge that is? Well, it's a challenge that the Chinese popular Chinese government and municipal of officials are up to. I have an office in Shanghai, and I talk to my team there quite often. And I just, before this call, was talking to one of the people there. Um, I would say they certainly are up to the challenge. They can do this administratively. Very few countries probably could, and very few countries have both the organization and the uh, sense of solidarity the Chinese population seems to have to participate in this uh, control measure. But nonetheless, there are hardships. I think that a lesson I would take forward for this is that it, there may be future pandemics and people should stockpile, the government should help them. And uh, so there aren't food shortages. It isn't that people are starving, but it's not business as usual when it comes to dinner time in China today, in Shanghai. And I'm guessing, Bill, that testing at this level is absolutely essential because most of the people who have the infection right now, the 13,000 that we were talking about, are asymptomatic. That's right. But, you know, they have a graded testing schedule where if there's a, they believe there are very few people that are infected, they'll pool 20 samples. If they feel there are higher degree of infection, they may pool 10 samples and then figure out which of those is, is positive. And in extreme cases, they'll test everybody individually. Now, if we look at the situation in Europe, Europe has seen a resurgence in the BA.2 variant a few weeks ago. The World Health Organization blamed this resurgence on the fact that many European countries have been lifting restrictions. And here, too, in the United States, a number of states are already beginning to lift restrictions as well. Um, what are the risks of doing this? It's very risky. 
Uh, I can say for my own country, for the first time, I took a plane trip. I came back, fortunately not with COVID, but a nasty cold. Um, if I caught a cold, I could have caught and got COVID if somebody had it. Um, this is not a time to relax. You know, New York, right where I, I live between New York and Connecticut, uh, New York is surging. It's beginning to come up. We see it in uh, the sewers. We see it in the percentage of people that are testing positive. We're not just relaxing and not wearing masks. We're not testing so much anymore. Um, people seem to be tired of this virus, but this virus is not tired with us. And most of the cases that you're seeing in a place like New York, are the is it asymptomatic? Well, it's in a well-vaccinated population, it's almost entirely um, asymptomatic. If you have by now four vaccines, say four doses of one of the mRNA vaccines, your chances of having any serious symptom may be as low as, uh, as 5% uh, of those that are not vaccinated. So it's really quite effective in reducing symptoms. Um, for the unvaccinated, it's the same as it was before, that perhaps uh, 20, 30 percent will have some serious symptoms. And it also seems that BA2, from a very detailed study in Hong Kong, is a much more serious infection for young children, particularly zero to five, and even more particularly from one to zero. It's a much more dangerous virus, according to the recent data from Hong Kong. You were talking about uh, vaccinations. Let's look at the situation right now. The CDC has approved uh, a second booster shot for people uh, over the age of 50. That's effectively four shots. What impact is that going to have? Well, that can save a lot of lives because we know that after three to four months, the effectiveness of the vaccine to prevent infection wanes to close to, to zero. So people who don't get this fourth shot are likely to get infected in the next wave of uh, this uh, infection. But if they do get the shot, they'll be somewhat protected from infection. And the very good news uh, is that it, these multiple shots seem to increase the level of protection from serious disease, and really very effectively uh, for people, even people who are quite old, in their 80s and 90s. It's protecting them against the serious consequences. So I'm recommending to all of my friends uh, 50 and over to get the fourth shot. And if their fourth shot was some time ago, this is way off the charts by now, but a fifth as well, four months after the fourth. It's no evidence for that, but I think it's prudent. What about other kinds of medications? Uh, Pfizer and Merck, uh, pharmaceutical companies, they have announced pills, and Russia has actually announced a nasal spray vaccine. Well, in terms of uh, treatment, uh, it works pretty well with remdesivir, but that's an intravenous administration. Hopefully, they're working to make it in pill form, or at least it's uh, intramuscular injection, but they don't have it yet. Paxlovid is working extremely well uh, in early infections and even to prevent infections if you've been exposed. It has a very dramatic effect on reducing uh, the viral load. There are many other drugs and uh, thoughts about what to do, including the monoclonal antibodies. The problem, even with some of the monoclonal antibody cocktails, is as the virus changes to become resistant to vaccines, it also becomes resistant to those. So as far as I'm aware, there's one or two that are working well against B2. One of them is called beptolivimab. Um, but it's not widely available, but it is a very effective antibody against BA1 and BA2, and uh, it's being used now. There's also Evusheld, which is a combination of two, which works well enough. It's not super, but it works well enough to reduce the seriousness of disease in those who are infected with BA1 and BA2. So is that going to be a continuous challenge in dealing with COVID, the fact that vaccines will have to play catch up with the variants all the time? Well, you know, it's, we're used to that with flu. Uh, this is happening more frequently than with the flu. It'll remain, it's going to be remain to be see how long this uh, uh, rapid change in antigenicity occurs, but it will be occurring over from 
all the years to come, as far as we can tell from what happens with the coronavirus colds. And by the way, so many people really don't talk about it. Coronavirus has been endemic in our livestock, our birds and our pigs and a number of other species, so and cattle. So we know that the same strains more or less can come back in slightly varied forms year after year for decades, if not a century. So this is going to go on for a long time. The WHO chief, uh, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, he was asked last week, how do we move forward and end this acute phase of the pandemic? And this is what he said. Let's listen. First, surveillance, laboratories, and public health intelligence. Second, vaccination, public health and social measures, and engaged communities. Third, clinical care for COVID-19 and resilient health systems. Fourth, research and development and equitable access to tools and supplies. And fifth, coordination at the response transitions from an emergency mode to long-term respiratory disease management. So, Bill, do you agree that's going to be the standard in dealing with this in the future? I think it cannot have been said better. Uh, the only thing I would add is that increasingly we're going to see a role for antiviral drugs, both prophylactically and pre-exposure. Uh, so we're going to be, or and post-exposure. So we'll, prophylactic means before you're exposed. Post-exposure means you know you've been exposed, so you take the drug, and then early infection. So we're going to have a lot more drugs over the coming years, uh -huh. and hopefully we can put it into place, something like we do with HIV AIDS. It is a preventable disease, even though there's no vaccine, through pre-exposure prophylactic by drugs that are highly potent, have a long half-life, and very few side effects. We can do it. But it's going to take an enormous research effort. And this is, I'm going to make a plea here. I'm in touch with a lot of people mm -hmm. who are interested in doing this kind of work, right. but they can't get funded. Even in the United States, we're not putting money like we did into HIV AIDS. There we put two and a half billion dollars a year into fundamental research. We're not doing that for COVID-19. What we're doing is bundling COVID-19 right. research with all sorts of other things. Yeah. We need much more research around the world. We can solve this problem. I don't think it will only be with vaccines, it will be with vaccines and drugs, okay. but we can't do it without the research support. Okay, Dr. William Hazeltine, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. To continue our discussion, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Cambridge in the United Kingdom is Dr. Chris Smith. He is a consultant clinical virologist at the University of Cambridge. From Salem, Oregon is Yan Liang. She is the Endowed Chair and Professor of Economics at Willamette University. And from Beijing, China, Ina Tangan is a political and economic affairs commentator. Welcome to all of you. Ina Tangan, let me start with you in Beijing. We've just been talking about the situation in Shanghai, 13,000 new cases there. And of course, the city just carried out that massive series of drug tests uh, on the population uh, there. Now, in Beijing, there have been reports of cases what are you seeing, and how is the city responding to this? Well, at, at this time, they're uh, responding uh, to actual cases. The, there's a very, very effective tracing program, so they know exactly who you've been in contact with, where you've been, all of these things. And as soon as uh, you know, you've been identified, that they basically close the loop. They get everybody who's been around you for you know X number of meters, and they notify them that they need to uh, quarantine. Um, but, you know, there's, there's uh, different um, responses, and right now uh, people are looking at Shanghai, but they're also looking at Shenzhen, which uh, ha was confronted with the same uh, problem, mm -hmm. uh, but they were much, you know, much more capable of, their, their approach was much more capable in terms of responding. Shenzhen is basically normal. Uh, they do have restrictions in terms of taking tests, going into public places. Uh, but they are slowly opening up uh, restaurants, uh, public uh, venues at 50 percent, et cetera. Dr. Chris Smith, great to have you with us again. Uh, the cases, most of the cases, rather, that we've been seeing in Shanghai are asymptomatic. What does that tell us about how this variant behaves? 
Well, in fact, I was talking to one of our infection control nurses at uh, my hospital just this afternoon, and I asked her the same question. Of the cases you're managing in what is one of the country's leading and largest hospitals, what fraction of them are asymptomatic? And she said, almost all of them. Now, that reflects the fact that in the UK, for example, we have a really high vaccine uptake rate more than 99% of the population have antibodies and more than 90% have antibodies because they've been vaccinated. But what a turnaround, because if we were asking that question about two years ago as we were going into lockdown for the first time and seeing stupendously high mortality rates, it was a very different picture. What we're seeing now is a population of people who have high levels of, of protection conferred by vaccine, but also conferred and reinforced by natural infection in many countries. But some countries have much packed uptake of vaccines. They also have vaccines that appear to be less reliable and less resilient, and they know it. And the Chinese vaccines that have been used aren't as good as some of the other performers. Mm -hmm. And so there is some concern that they could see, not just the rosy picture that you're painting, a lot of asymptomatic cases, they could see in certain sectors of society, particularly older people, higher levels of breakthrough, higher levels of severe disease, which is why I think they're being more cautious in this instance. But it is welcome news that the vast majority of people are seeing lower levels of, of symptomatology. They're, they're mm. being much more trivially infected. One other thing that we're seeing in China is that uh, medical personnel there, they've started using traditional Chinese medicine uh, to treat COVID, to treat people who have been infected with the virus. The WHO says they see the potential in the use of these kind of medications. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think that any kind of advance that will help us to knock COVID on the head is to be welcomed, but it must be done, evaluated and properly trialled in a correct clinical and ethical way. And just in the last few days, we've seen the data on ivermectin, for example. For many months, mm -hmm. people have been clamoring about this anti-parasitic, anti-worm drug that they said was going to change the game on COVID. It's now been subject to proper scrutiny in trials, as have in the past other game changers, as they were held to be, like hydroxychloroquine, which, when subjected to proper evaluation, turned out to be damp squibs. They made no difference whatsoever. In fact, they may have made patients worse. So certainly it is important that we follow up leads, we evaluate potential drugs, we evaluate them properly. We may turn over some stones and find some gold nuggets lurking underneath. Equally, if we don't do this properly and carefully, we could be misled. So it's very important that we don't ignore things for the sake of ignoring them, but equally we don't uh, find ourselves being misled because we don't evaluate them properly. Anna Tangan, uh, Chris Smith there was talking about the effectiveness of the vaccines in China. What kind of efficacy have you seen there? Well, it's, it's not a question of the efficacy here because you've had one of the lowest infection rates in the world. It's, it really goes to the studies themselves. Uh, I always advocate that it's better to listen to science than uh, uh, anecdotal. Um, and quite frankly, in, in Hong Kong, they've, and that was backed up by... Uh, peer review, uh, the Chinese uh, vaccines actually have worked very well. Sin uh, Sino uh, Sinovac uh, has been compared as uh, equaling as the top MRA in certain vectors. Now remember, uh, I, I, I was fascinated by Dr. Hazeltine's uh, analysis. This is a pandemic that is evolving, and you have to evolve how you respond to it. Uh, not only in terms of the physical environment uh, controlling the spread, but also in terms of the uh, treatments. And the unfortunate uh, part, which you didn't mention, is that by allowing people mm. to uh, walk around, even with these asymptomatic right. cases, you're in essence creating human petri dishes, which right. is going to allow more variants. Yan Liang, great to see you. Uh, China is sticking with its uh, zero COVID policy, and that policy, of course, calls for lockdowns as well as restrictions on travel. The potential downside of that policy, of course, is that it could impact the economy. Are we seeing that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so if we look at March's number, which is the month where uh, many of the 
cities and provinces were in the lockdown. Uh, we have seen the service sector PMI, the Purchasing Manager Index, has dipped down to 46.7, and that is a clear sign of contraction. Uh, the manufacturing PMI is not doing much better. Um, it is also down um, to 40, uh, sorry, 49.5. So um, all this shows that the economy is being hit because of the virus and because of the lockdown. Um, but to add to what Tengen is talking about uh, when it comes to the efficacy of uh, vaccines, I think it's not only that we need to have effective vaccine, but also increase the vaccination rate. Uh, right now, I think over uh, about 40 percent of the elderly in China has yet to get the first dose of the vaccine. So I think to promote that vaccination is really important. Um, and I think China's reality is it's a vast country uh, population wise um, with this very infectious disease um, and 60 percent of the residents are in the rural area with very limited resources medical wise. So I think it's very important um, to uphold sort of the uh, contained virus kinds of principle. But of course, some of the measures can be implemented better. For example, not separating the very young children from their parents um, and also maybe allow those um, symptom-free COVID patients to isolate at home to minimize a little bit the sort of the negative impact on the economic and social activities. So that figure that you mentioned up to 40% of elderly people in China have not yet been vaccinated. What's the plan there? How does the government intend addressing that? Well, I think the government is trying to promote um, the vaccinations. But what we have seen so far, I think the focus has all um, has been really, you know, trying to get people to do the test. So a lot of focus has been, you know, trying to cope with, you know, detecting whether the viruses are somewhere, right, in the population. So I think um, what needs to happen really is to take one step ahead of the virus um, instead of, you know, focus so much on detecting it. Um, I think at the same time, really to roll out vaccinations, especially in the rural areas, um, in some of the less developed areas. Good. Chris Smith, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, Europe is facing a surge of the BA2 variant, uh, and there are also other new variants which are causing concern in the United Kingdom. What is the outlook in the UK if more variants emerge? Well, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, because this is an evolving, moving target, and it has plenty more roles of the genetic dice where Omicron and the spin-off of Omicron, BA2, have come from. And this is because it's a product of the same processes that cause the evolution of every life form on Earth. And as we put barriers in the way of the virus, then that's selecting for viruses that know, in inverted commas, how to surmount or bypass those barriers, which is why we're seeing this evolution in the direction of travel of more transmissible variants, but probably going to be less lethal in the long run. People acknowledge that this Omicron and now the spin-off of Omicron are less lethal in a relatively immune population. And this is because people already have a foundation of immunity, which means when they run into this infection, mm -hmm. they do get asymptomatically infected. So we think the natural history going forward of this infection is one where slowly the world builds that population level of immunity, which means this virus retreats into the background and behaves much more like the common cold. Indeed, other members of the coronavirus family do cause common cold type symptoms and have done for hundreds to thousands right. of years. One of them did cause a pandemic about 100 years ago with very high mortality rate and now behaves as a cold. So we think that COVID-19 will probably follow the same sort of trajectory. What about the variant in the UK known as XE? What can you tell us about that? Uh, I'm not too familiar with that one, but the fact is that there are going to be loads of them and th that we know that this virus is continuously evolving and it's also mixing itself up where you get Delta mixing up with Omicron and Omicron mixing with other variants yet to come. So some people are dubbing these things Deltacrons, for example. Mm. We're going to see a range of different variants emerging. One was found in Cyprus, for example. I think that is the XE variant, yeah. which um, do doctors detected there. Initially, people thought it was a medical mistake, and then they realized, no, actually, this is, this is a real phenomenon. The numbers are 
very, very small at the moment. And that's kind of reassuring, because if it were huge numbers mm. rapidly displacing the existing variants, then we'd say, well, look, there has to be something about this which is more pathological, which is more aggressive, more transmissible. That doesn't seem to be the case because it's been documented for a long time. Yeah. So that being the case, we don't think this poses a huge threat, but it reflects the fact that this is, a, as I say, a moving target. It's evolving and it's continuously Sh sort of shuffling its genetic hand and in that mm -hmm. way we're going to see loads and loads of these sorts of variants really playing a game of, of evolution there the virus versus our immunity as a population in the years to come Yang Liang, we've also seen that in Europe, many countries there have lifted restrictions and they've actually stopped surveillance and the reason for that is that they want to cut costs is COVID also impacting European economies in a big way right now? Right. I think, you know, that's still yet to, to, to see, right? So even though, yes, economic activities resume because of lifting all these restrictions, but at the same time, um, you know, the human death and the, the illnesses, they all take a toll on the economy. And going back to, you know, the case of China, I think, you know, companies have tried ways to mitigate, um, you know, Shanghai being, in, you know, the financial hub, the stock exchange in Shanghai has offered online services um, to for example, IPO approval meetings to roadshows to consultations. Um, they encourage employees to come out um, on the ground of their offices so then they'll be able to run their businesses. Um, so I think, yes, the economy is very important, but yet at the same time, it's so important to protect lives um, of these people. Um, one last thing is I would say, you know, um, it is the matter that these are all short-term measures, um, Draganian lockdowns. So the government needs to play an important role, you know, to help to support the people, supplying food, medical essentials, and better yet, maybe provide some stimulus checks like, you know, some of the advanced countries have been doing um, so then people can still pay their rent, pay their utility bills, and so on and so forth. Anna Tang, and I've only got a minute left, but, you know, Yang Liang was telling us earlier on about the impact that uh, this, these outbreaks of COVID are having in China. It must be quite a balancing act for the government right now. Not really. I mean, you can take a political approach, an economic approach, or a scientific one. The scientific one has uh, worked for China. By having these short, sharp shocks, they've been able to avoid uh, the kind of long-term economic problems that you've had in other countries. It's been very successful. They'll continue evolving their approach. So there's no question that you have to take the scientific one. Uh, otherwise, you're just creating, as I said, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of human petri dishes which are uh, going to be out there evolving new strains, which are going to be even more problem problematic. Okay, and we need to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference.